Well, we've been uh, just started on an 18-week series in 1 Corinthians, and some of you weren't here last week, and, and uh, I'm not going to give you everything just to um, catch you up, but just to say this, that last week we, we covered the first 17 verses of the first chapter, and uh, the whole purpose of the letter was revealed there as this church at Corinth as receiving a letter from Paul, and evidently word had gotten to him that there were divisions, that there was fighting in this church. And some of them said, uh, we are of Paul. Some of them said, we are Apollos. Some of them said, we are Peter. And uh, they had different factions. And so um, this is a church that Paul had planted in this uh, very um, uh, economic, um, fruitful, uh, good economics in Corinth and a, a growing place, a real melting pot of people. And right after the strong words of Paul to the Corinthians about their fighting and their factions, he he brings up the message of his preaching. And he tells them, the the last verse that we had last week was verse 17. He said, Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words so that Christ's cross will be emptied of its meaning. And he, he tells them, he says, you know, clever words, eloquent speech isn't... Uh, really a good thing on this he says because I don't want to to overshadow the power of the cross and so today we're going to talk about the cross and the message of the gospel that's powerful and effective because the cross is is not emptied of its meaning you know I, I would guess that there's probably in this world never been a time when the cross has been more prolific than what it is in America I mean, we have crosses everywhere. We see crosses everywhere. Many of us are wearing crosses right now. But America has crosses, and, and churches, you know, put crosses, even if you're a, a, a new mega church, it's like, you know, southeast over in Louisville. They've got that huge building, but up at the top of it, they've got the, the gold cross. And, and it used to be that the crosses in a city were the highest point of elevation. And you could look out across the city, and all you would see is the steeples of the churches and the crosses. Not so much anymore, you know. It's now what you see is the bank buildings, right? We don't see the the church crosses. And what what does that tell us about America today, you know, as to what's really important? But but anyway, a few weeks ago, we were uh, driving through Illinois on, on Interstate 57, and close to Effingham, we came across this giant cross. Have you ever seen one of these things? I mean, I, you're just going down the road, and all of a sudden, boom, you know, this humongous cross. And we said, man... Who did that? Wow, is there a little bitty church underneath that thing, you know? That thing is gigantic. And I understand that down in Texas there's a couple. I don't know if they're bigger. They're probably bigger than the one that that the Yankees got in Illinois. But, uh, you know, it's just gigantic cross. And here in Kentucky, when we go to eastern Kentucky or uh, even western Kentucky, what do we see? We see those three crosses on the hills as you're driving around, you know, and it's, it's neat, you know, just out in the middle of the top of a hill, uh, people put those three crosses, but I mean, the crosses are just all over America. It's extremely popular. Hip hop artists wear them, you know, with all their bling around their necks, and Madonna's got one, and God Guy's got one, and your grandma's got one, and your, your eight year old's got one, and everybody's got some crosses, right? I mean, it's just everywhere, and that's why I said, I don't think it's probably ever been a time that the cross has been as prolific as it is right now. It's really popular. And uh, to some, the cross is meaningless. I mean, it's just jewelry. And to others, the cross is the most important symbol because what it, it means to us is that he made, he made uh, him sin who knew no sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. And when we see a cross, that's what we think is we think of Jesus, and we think of the sacrifice, and we think of forgiveness. You know, the cross wasn't uh, a symbol for Christianity until the Middle Ages. Uh, it's kind of a latecomer on the scene. Now it is the prominent cross. Uh, the cross is the prominent symbol for Christianity, but early it was the ichthus. That's, that ichthus is not just a, 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 you know, a festival down at Wilmore. Ichthus is, uh, means the Greek word for fish, and it's an acronym, and uh, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, is what it meant. And the fish would be uh, scribbled on the walls in the catacombs of Rome, and it was the secret symbol 
for a Christian. And if you put the ichthus on your house and someone else would know that, uh, you know, you were a Christian or, you know, you could, uh, I guess you could tattoo it on the back of your donkey and you're walking right in, you know, it's kind of like the first bumper sticker, hey, you know, uh, or their cart or, or whatever. Oh, come on, get past it, man. Uh, but the cross uh, was not used as that kind of a symbol um, because it was still a symbol of torture and death. And Christians just didn't think of that as being something that they wanted to show everybody. It was, the cross was still uh, an item of sorrow. They lived the reality of the cross, but it was not a good symbol. And, and evidently the church in Corinth was beginning to kind of shy away from the reality of the cross in favor of a more intellectual or acceptable gospel. So here we go. There's our scripture for today. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning with verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed. But it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Well, let, let's, let's just hang here a little bit with, with verse 18. What is the message of the cross? What, what is that? He talks about the message of the cross. Uh, the message is, is that God was reconciling the world to himself. Uh, that's what Paul, uh, in his next letter, in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.19, would say, God was reconciling the world to himself uh, through Christ, not by counting people's sins against them. There's the, the message of the cross in one place. That's the message for those who are being saved. It says that Jesus died for your sins, and, and that, as he says, is the power of salvation that the message of the cross, that God was reconciling you to himself through Jesus. And God says, if you receive that, you are being saved. Um, if it is a present reality in your life, if this is your daily thought, if this is what you're living by, that my sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ today, then you are being saved. But if you haven't accepted that, then Paul says quite clearly, he says, you are being destroyed. It's not one day you will be destroyed, but today you are being destroyed. Your, your life is falling apart. You're going the wrong direction. Um, so the cross is a great divider. We, we are saved not just by believing that there is a God. You know, people get this mixed up. You, you talk to people and you say, well, do you have any faith? They go, oh, yeah, I believe in God. That, that's not the question. It's not the question, do you believe in God? Uh, James, brother of Jesus, in his little book in the second chapter says, well, even the demons believe in God and they shudder, you see. To just say, I believe that there is a God, this intellectual exercise of saying, yeah, I can look around and see there's a God, that, that doesn't do anything. It's just the first step. The, the, the real question is, well, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? What about this cross? What, how are you going to resolve the sin problem? you see, that you have. You believe the message of the cross. Do you believe that God became one of us, that God lived a perfect life? This is old-time religion, isn't it? God became one of us, lived a perfect life, gave his life on a cross for your sins. Do you believe that? If you do, he says, then you're being saved. God says the cross reveals who we really are. But I mean, isn't the cross just... I think this is what the Corinthians are saying. This is bad marketing. You know, this isn't selling real well. This whole thing about the bloody cross and Jesus dying and all that stuff, you know. I, th I think what was going on in Corinth is still going on today. The cross is not a really nice message. It's, it's, it's about torture and sacrifice and, and it's bloody and way too much suffering and that whole sin thing. Can't we just call it mistakes? Do we have to use that word sin? You know, that the whole world made some mistakes. 
but God still loves them. That, that's the way we change the gospel around, is everybody has made mistakes, but God still loves you. Forget about the mistakes. Let's move forward. Right? That's the way we change things around here. We leave the cross out. Greek philosophers and the intellectuals, well, they just don't talk about things like that. It's embarrassing, this whole sacrifice thing. Bad marketing. Let's move on. Verse 22. He says, Jews ask for signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The Jews were looking for some signs that Jesus was, in fact, Messiah. You know, as we read through the gospel as Gentiles and we see all the healings and we go, Jesus loved people so much. And that was the message, but not the prime message. The reason that he healed the, the lepers and the deaf and the dumb and the crippled was as a sign to the Jewish people that he was, in fact, the awaited Messiah. That was what the Messiah would do. And so he was performing those signs for them to say, I am. I'm the guy you've been waiting for. Um, and then the Greeks, it says, well, they loved wisdom, you know. The, the Greek culture, uh, Corinth is just real close to Athens. And in Athens, we have Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. Well, one of the highest civilizations ever to be formed the Greeks, and they love the intellectual exercise and philosophies and new teachings, loved new teachings, you see. They would go anywhere to hear a good speaker. Um, what uh, was said was not as important as to how it was said. Was he eloquent? Did he, you know, this is the rhetorical era. And they would uh, go a long ways just to hear somebody speak. It was all in the delivery and the emotional impact and the presentation. And Paul says the message of the cross is the opposite of these things. It's the opposite of signs and wisdoms. He says that to a Jew it's a scandal, to the Greek it's foolishness. This is kind of where our present day image and beliefs about the cross uh, impact this. To us, the cross is a piece of jewelry uh, and, and a symbol of God's love and grace, but to them, to the Jews, it meant that Jesus was not the Messiah is what the cross meant to the Jews. See, he, he could not be the Messiah and die that kind of cursed death. The Messiah would not do that. Cursed is every man who hangs on a tree, was the scripture. And so this nullified him as, as being a Messiah. This disqualified him. And to the Greek, it, well, the cross is just plain stupid. It's just silly. Why would a God, strong and powerful, submit himself to something weak and so foolish as crucifixion? In Corinth, the real champion was the person who could persuade other people through the force of argument. In those days, people went through to coliseums and theaters just to hear somebody talk and argue. In the way that we'd go hear a good band or see some sports person, they would go and just hear somebody talk. Oh, wasn't he eloquent? Wow, the debate, the logic was phenomenal. That's what, they got, that's what got them off. That's what they enjoyed doing in their day. Corinthians were saying, um, Paul, the, the problem with our gospel is that this, this is just bad marketing. It doesn't persuade anybody. It's just not working. We, we try it out, you know, and, and it's just not having any effect. It isn't drawing a crowd, and we need something catchy, man. If we, if, could, could you give us a new program, some kind of new marketing technique, you know, spin this for us, some kind of catchy slogan, you know. This would work okay. We can't get people to come to our arguments. They, they think the cross is dumb. The apostle responds by saying the essence of the gospel is not about persuasion. No one is ever persuaded to the cross. You don't argue them, see, into faith. He says that's why you're having problems. The only people who will ever find the cross to make sense in their lives are the people who are called it's a prominent word as we go through Corinthians, the called. 
The essence of calling is the word convicting, I think. That's, that's another old-fashioned word that kind of gets mixed up today. We think, well, conviction means that you've been found guilty, right? And what we're talking about when we say convicting is that, that that's when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And you begin to look at something that you've done, and you realize that you've hurt God and you've hurt other people. That's called conviction. It's a good thing. Well, when God convicts us of something, it's a good thing. He means he's, he's trying to catch us before we really screw our lives up or somebody else's lives up. And the whole thing about the called is conviction. The, the, the men and women who suddenly wake up to the fact that they are nothing more than, excuse me, sinners, need of grace and forgiveness. As long as people believe that they're not accountable, I'm not hurting anybody. Who's going to judge me? It's got nothing to do with anybody but me. I can do whatever I want then you see they're not accountable and they have no conviction and the cross will just seem silly and foolish. Here's a picture of some second century Roman graffiti that uh, pokes fun at the message of the cross. It shows a man with a donkey's head on a cross uh, scribbled on the wall uh, the words Alaximenos worships his God making fun of the Christian because of the donkey head. I can say that more in the vernacular, but I'm not. The donkey head God being crucified. To the Romans, it's just silly. It's ridiculous. It's a joke. And I think the, that the cross, the message of the cross in our culture is, is pretty silly and ridiculous, really. Uh, we live in an age with atheism on the rise. I think most of us in the room are aware of that. Just in the few short years that you guys have lived, you've seen the, the resurgence of atheism in our culture. If you go online, any kind of a, a forum or a chat room or anything, you'll, and if you espouse any kind of religious faith, you will be told that you're judgmental and that you know, you're trying to persuade me. Atheism is on the rise, especially in the millennials, the youngest generation. Some of you are there, uh, age 18 to 29. Washington Post reported that young people are not only leaving churches, they're leaving the faith. Uh, one in four young adults choose unaffiliated now when asked about their religion. And of those who claim to be unaffiliated, 25%, okay, half of those previously had said that they were affiliated. So we're losing, you know, about 12, 13 percent of this generation that are just dropping out and saying, I have no faith. I just don't believe anything about God. It's not just do they not even believe anything about Jesus Christ. I just don't believe anything about God. Not even the first step. Strong dominance by atheists today in our culture. And the attitude, I think, is spreading in the church. We're becoming embarrassed by this. We're becoming embarrassed about worshiping Jesus Christ and taking his cross. I find myself doing it. I really do. I admit that to you. You know, I, I, I try to not talk about uh, the sacrifice and the atonement quite so much when I'm around some people because it, it embarrasses people, see? And I don't want them to think that I'm judgmental or, or that, you know, I'm one of those, those old guys that's just hard line. But it's spreading. There's more and more emphasis on the teaching of Jesus, less emphasis on the cross today. And I don't bring that up so you'll go out and fight those atheists. Yeah, you know me better than that. that that's not what our point is, is to, is to launch something against this new atheist group, you know, and beat them back into compliance with the faith. But actually, I look at this as to actually be, a, you know, a really great opportunity for the church. The harvest is plentiful, friends. Not too many harvesters today. But the harvest is plentiful out there. There's a great need today in America, especially in the younger generations. You know, I admit it's easy to be intimidated by this. I look at the symbols, the power and the intelligence, the titles, the celebrity status that some have, the books that they write. They're so smooth. Man, I wish I was smooth like that. You know, not really, I guess. You know, I never had it in me to be smooth. Uh, I've always been a kind of, uh, you know, you transcribe my sermons like, wow, did he take English? But 
the, the, the thing is, I mean, there's some people, they just talk and it just rolls out of their mouths and go, wow, when I grow up, I want to be like him. And he's 26, you know, and I, I feel like, you know, I'm intimidated. Some It's easy to be intimidated by that. There's so many messages that are being preached today. And, and, you know, we want to be relevant, and, and we want to be popular, and we, we're young, and we, we want to be rich, and we want to be influential, and the people in our church are the movers and shakers in town, and we get things done, and, we, you know, if you want something done, you can come to us, and we can make it happen, and we're smart, and we're intellectual. It's so easy to be intimidated, and yet we're told that the wise things of this world, the proud things, the popular things, they're foolishness to God. God says the message of the cross is only power. Everything else appears to be wise and appears to be powerful, but only appears that way to those who are perishing. Wow, well, that, that's a hard word, isn't it? <laughs> I, I stopped this week and I was going through this. I'm going, okay, how much do I admire all that? Because when I admire all of that, that means that I'm in my perishing mode. I've stepped over here from being saved in my saving mode to, to being perishing when I say I want to be like that I want to imitate him or I want to be like her and if I could just write a book and if I could just be popular and, and God says well you're in your perishing mode again because you see it's the only reason it appeals to you is because you're headed the wrong direction A.W. Tozier said the cross is rough and it's deadly but it is effective amen A.W. You know, I have on, on uh, many occasions been called to the hospital or to a home to pray with someone who was dying. Um, in the final moment, moments in desperation, they call the pastor. And daddy's dying, and he's never been much of a churchgoer, but let's see if the pastor can do something. I, I'm not belittling those people. Um, I think you should call the pastor. But you realize the kind of pressure that puts on the pastor? You, you need to go into the room, and, and in a few minutes, you need to say something to this man that's going to save his soul for eternity. He's rejected God for 80 years of his life, and now you're going to go in there, and everybody's watching, and they're listening. So what do you do as a pastor? Some people pull out their little book, and they read a prayer, and have, you know, Psalm 23, Assure the man that uh, his fight is just about over, that he's going to, as we say, a better place. It's just about time for you. You're going to get your reward. When as we say those words, we know that that's probably not true. We, we want everybody to have faith in the room, but the reality is, is that that's probably not going to happen as far as I know. Man, it's rough. I mean, it, it really is. I've been there. I've done that. In those moments, you know, the shadow of the cross. If, if you're in a Catholic hospital, there's always a crucifix in the room. Praise God for a crucifix at that time. But the shadow of the cross comes over the room, and you know at that time that all that you can say, all that really matters is the message of the cross. Everything else is just totally in insignificant. Would that we live in such a way that those dying words, the importance of what is said at the last moment in life, were our daily bread, you know? And what do you say? You say, sir, no matter what you've done, the blood of Jesus spilled for you is enough today. That's what you say. No matter what you've done, I don't care who you've harmed, what you said, I want you to know today, brother, that the blood of Jesus is enough. If you would just say and accept in your, in your heart right now that it is enough, that Jesus died for me, okay? That's enough. I've done that uh, many times. Sometimes you leave the room knowing that, yes, it is okay. And sometimes you leave the room going, I just, I just didn't get the cross there today. I just, I said the wrong thing. I, I read that. I prayed that, and and the cross just wasn't clear to him today. Do you, you know what it's like to pray with somebody as they're dying and know that they didn't receive, that that you didn't, you didn't bring it, you know, 
And, oh, I know you're thinking, oh, Don, don't beat yourself up for this. You did everything you could. Sometimes I haven't. You know, I'll come out with that. Sometimes I haven't done everything that I have. Sometimes I wanted to appear to be more intellectual and smarter and wiser and slick and, and, and culturally cool and relevant, and I didn't bring the cross. Teachers can teach you, but they can't save you, you know. When we tell them uh, the cross is the only message that saves, it's foolishness unless you've trusted in it. It's silly, it's embarrassing, it, it's brutal, it's barbaric, but it's the only message that saves. This is it. There's nothing else. We could say, well, Jesus was a great teacher. Oh, well, he was. So was Gandhi. Gandhi is a great teacher, you know. Well, when you come to your last moments, are you going to yell out for Gandhi? Of course not. Gandhi's not going to save you. Who's going to save you? It's going to be Jesus. Teachers can teach you, but they can't save you. Only when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, the one who came down and died for us, do we find that we are called. There was a book written a few years ago um, by Ellen Vaughn. It's, it's called The God Who Hung on the Cross. And, and uh, Ellen tells the story of a gripping story about how the gospel came to a Cambodian village. Um, in September of 1999, uh, a guy named Pastor Tai Sung uh, traveled to Kampong Thom, Providence, northern Cambodia. And, and in that area, there were no Christians. All had trusted in Buddhism and spirituality, spirit, spiritism. Christianity was virtually unheard of. Missionaries had never been successful there. But much to Singh's surprise, when he arrived in one small rural village, the people warmly embraced him and his message about Jesus and the first time that he preached. And when he asked the villagers about their openness to the gospel, an old woman shuffled forward and she bowed and she grasped his hands and she asked, we have been waiting for you for 20 years. And then she told him the story of the mysterious God who had hung on the cross. Listen. In 1970s, um, the Khmer Rouge, uh, the brutal communist uh, government regime, just swept across Cambodia, murdered almost everybody, just annihilated villages. You guys are too young to remember that. We, we saw those accounts on the news every night. When the f soldiers finally came in 1979 to this little village, uh, they rounded everybody up and gave them shovels and put them to work digging their own graves, which they did. And then they stood before the graves with the soldiers behind them with their guns waiting for them to die. And some screamed to Buddha and others screamed to demon spirits or to their ancestors. One of the women, one of the women started to cry for help based on her childhood memory, a story her mother had told her about a god who had hung on a cross. And the woman prayed to that unknown god on a cross. And Surely if this God who knew what suffering was, surely he would come to their aid because they were suffering. Suddenly this one woman's cry turned into a wail as the entire village was praying to this unknown God who hung on a cross and had suffered. And as they continued facing their graves and the wailing, it, it calmed down and turned into just a, a quiet crying and there was a silence and and slowly, they dared to turn around and notice that the soldiers were gone. As the old woman finished telling the story, she told Pastor Sang that ever since that humid day from 20 years ago, the villagers had been waiting and waiting for someone to come and share the rest of the story about the God who hung on a cross and suffered. Well, people are waiting today. People are waiting for the message of the cross. They really are. It, it, it may seem embarrassing, it may seem archaic and, and barbaric, and you think you're an old-time preacher talking about the cross, but they are waiting to hear the message of the God who suffers with them. Let us give them the message of the cross. I want to finish up this, this chapter here. Paul goes on to this message to the church at Corinth. 
He says, look at your situation, verse 26, when you were called, brothers and sisters, by ordinary human standards. Not many were wise, not many were powerful, not many were from the upper class, but God chose what the world considers foolish to shame the wise. God chose what the world considers weak to shame the strong. And God chose what the world considers low class and low life, what is considered to be nothing to reduce what is considered to be something to nothing. So no human being can brag in God's presence. Verse 30, it's because God, it is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. He became wisdom for, from God for us. This means that he made us righteous and holy and he delivered us. This is consistent with what is written, the one who brags should brag in the Lord. Not a real complimentary message to a church. Paul tells them that, eh, you guys, you're really nobodies, you know? Not many of you are very smart. Not many of you are very powerful. Not many of you were born to great parents. You're a bunch of nobodies. God chose the weak, God chose the foolish, God chose the powerless. Why does God do that? Because God wants to prevent us, one reason, from being arrogant and standing in his presence and thinking that we dared to save ourselves. God chose nobodies, his sons and daughters. Well, today I have a question for you. I want to rumble around. I've probably given you enough, but... Uh, I want to give you one more thing to think about because this isn't about the Corinthians. You know that. This isn't about Corinthians. This is about you. God's sneaky like that. He writes a letter 2,000 years ago and, and plans it so it's brought up in some little church here on Todd's Road in Lexington so that you might hear this. Here's my question for you. Are you being saved? See, I didn't ask you if you've been saved. Are you being saved? And by save, this word means whole and well. Okay, it's not just about someday that you're going to be in heaven, but today, are you being whole and well? Are you, is the message of the cross to you today doing that for you? No, you, you can only answer that for yourself. I, I can give you some hints like it's, like it's spoken to me, and that is that if if I'm a little embarrassed about this, if, if I want to rise up and be eloquent and are relevant, are cool, okay, I, it's, it's, I'm not being saved, okay? I, that, that means that I'm trusting, I'm not really hearing the message of the cross, and it's leading me to destruction, this, this coolness and this relevance and this intelligence and, and trusting in philosophies and teachings and doctrines and, and church buildings and all that junk, okay? But what about you today? I tell you, tell us all the time, don't I, that at any given moment in life, you're either turned towards God or you're turned away from God. Where are you this morning? Let me, let me urge you. If you're turned towards God, then just receive it. Just, just get all you can get today. Just soak it in, all right? Well, let you, let, let you uh, confirm that you are a son or a daughter of God today, that I am being saved. But if you're not, all right, please turn around today. Don't say, uh, you know, um, I, I, I'm embarrassed to do that in front of those people. Please, please don't. Um, you know, I don't know what you're going to need to do to turn around. Um, maybe you can do it where you are in your chair. Maybe you can do it just between you and God. That's never worked for me. Okay? I need some kind of demonstrative sign. I need to fall on my knees on, on the step of the altar. Or I need to go talk to somebody and say, I've sinned and I've fallen short of the glory of God. And, and I want to turn today. I, I don't know, maybe as you come for communion today, that that will be enough that you'll say, I've been foolish and, and I want to be wise. I want to trust in the cross. But please, please consider it. Um, for each one of us, that day does come when it's our last breath. And for some... Um, they spend all their days inside of a church building and even belong to church organizations and still come to that last breath and they don't know. Isn't that a scary thing? Spend all that effort. Pretend all that time. Listen to all those long, boring sermons. And you get to that last moment and you don't know. Hmm. Now let's, let's sit for a minute with that.
thirsty Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out